Good afternoon. The event that has brought you here today is organized by the Peter Wall Institute of Advanced Studies with the collaboration of the Consulate of France in Vancouver and of the Museum of Anthropology. This evening is being recorded by the Ike Barber Learning Center to be made available as a webcast in their respective website. At the entrance of the museum, you can leave your contacts and business cards for future contact for this kind of events. On behalf of the Museum of Anthropology, I want to thank you all for your presence to what promises to be a memorable evening. In order for you to get here, you have walked the Salish path. The Salish path is the artwork by Muslim artist Susan Point at the entrance of the museum. In Susan Point words, this artwork is based on the transformation of a thumb or a toe print, incorporating designs related to the life forms found in the land, in the sea, and in the skies surrounding Moa. This artwork emphasizes the Salish connection to the site, and it reminds us all that Moa, and indeed UBC, is in traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Halkomelan speaking Muslim people to whom we want to express our gratitude. Today, I would also ask you to be generous and to allow yourselves to engage in today's conversation from the particular perspective of being in this specific place at this particular time, and to make such perspective a part of the ecology of your own relations and to bring this added value to conversations such as the one we are having today. This conversation would not have been possible without all the effort by Emma McEntee at the Peter Wall Institute, and especially from Professor Neil Safir uh, from the History Department at UBC. To introduce today's conversation and today's distinguished guests, I ask you to join me in welcoming Professor Neil Safir from the Department of History. Neil. Thank you, Nunu. Uh, thank you um, to the Museum of uh, Anthropology, and thank you to the Musqueam people for uh, your hospitality tonight, as always. As Nuno mentioned, uh, my name is Neil Safir, and I'm Associate Professor of History here at UBC, and also a faculty associate of the Peter Wall Institute for Advanced Studies, which has provided logistical and financial support for this event and for the extended stays of our two guests. Uh, as Nunu mentioned, this uh, event would not have been possible without the assistance of the Museum of Anthropology, of course, and Nunu himself, uh, and the French Consulate of Vancouver, especially uh, the work of Reynald uh, Bollet, the attaché culturel, um, whose gracious and enthusiastic collaboration uh, I've very much appreciated these last months and indeed years. Merci, Reynald. Um, everyone is invited to join us for a reception following uh, the conversation uh, sponsored by the consulate. Tonight we have a rare opportunity to bring together two of France's most preeminent intellectuals in a discussion about one of our planet's most pressing, pressing issues. For the past several weeks, UBC has had the privilege of hosting Philippe Descola, as Peter Wall Distinguished Visiting Professor. Descola occupies the chair in the Anthropology of Nature at the Collège de France and is director of that same institution's Laboratoire d'Anthropologie Sociale, an institution founded by Philippe's dissertation advisor and mentor, Claude Lévi-Strauss. Initially trained as a philosopher, Philippe's work has, since the 1970s, focused on the relationship between human societies and the natural environments they inhabit, with a particular focus on the South American lowlands of Western Amazonia. But what is most striking about his extraordinary fieldwork among the Hivaro Ashuar 
and the path-breaking research that he has carried out beyond this region as well, are the profound conclusions he has drawn about the relationship between nature and culture more broadly in anthropology. And he has steadfastly and convincingly argued that it is time to move beyond this nature-cultural binary that had for so long reigned in anthropological literature. To do so, he developed a series of four ontological dispositions that help us to understand the range of engagement that with the natural world in a remarkably diverse range of cultures. And this uh, work, which was published in France in 2005 under the name Par de la Nature et Culture, has just been published this year by the University of Chicago Pr Press in an English translation. So it is now available for us. He is currently engaged in a multi-year study on landscape and landscape perception, a notion that he argues has been misapplied and poorly appropriated by a host of disciplines, including most interestingly, in interestingly his own. Since this past Friday, as those of you who attended this past Monday's Wall Exchange Lecture certainly will know, we have also had the pleasure of hosting Bruno Latour, professor and director of the Program in Scientific Humanities and Digital Methods at the Institut des Sciences Politiques à Paris. Like Philippe Descola, Bruno Latour was originally trained in philosophy, but soon enough began to practice anthropology. In his case, not in the Amazonian rainforest, but rather as part of a French civil service mission to Abidjan and, most crucially for his work, uh, I believe, in the Salk laboratories of San Diego. Based on these experiences, among others, Latour went on to develop a series of very influential propositions in the then developing field of science studies. Through books such as Laboratory Life, Science in Action, and We Have Never Been Modern, Latour developed in collaboration with other colleagues at the Ecole Nationale des Mines, actor network theory, theory that had a tremendous impact in a variety of fields uh, by attempting to diminish the separation between human and non-human actors when describing chains of interconnection and the move from experimental ex inscriptions to scientific fact. And Professor Latour's work deals more broadly with this interwoven and intricate, intricate relationship between science and politics. Um, and he's, in fact, interested in his words in manipulating knots and, quote, untying a few strings in order to knot them back together differently. Um, most recently, Professor Latour has embarked on an ambitious multimedia project entitled An Inquiry into Modes of Existence, about which we will have the chance to ask a few questions in just a moment. In light of their presence here in Vancouver and at UBC at the same time, which admittedly was hardly a chance operation, we decided to bring them together this evening to build a synergistic engagement across their own distinct disciplinary and methodological boundaries. And even though professors Latour and Descola are personal friends, and British Columbia is known around the world for its friendly culture, um, we even know that the buses here apologize when they are full. Uh, we still uh, would like this session to grapple with some larger and perhaps even unexpected questions, both thematically and methodologically. And I should also say at the outset that um, uh, for this conversation, for different reasons, both Professor Latour and uh, Professor Descola um, have, are, are going to be operating on territory that is not entirely familiar to, to them um, in, different, in different sorts of ways. So this really will be a kind of, there will be a spontaneity, I hope, and an informality to the discussion involving you as well that, um, that we can really learn, for, learn from. For all of these reasons, we've chosen as this evening's conversation piece the concept of the Anthropocene. This is a term that owes its origins to the year 2000, when chemist Paul Crutzen and marine science specialist Eugene Sturmer suggested that in recognition of the massive impact and scale at which human activities were affecting the Earth and its atmosphere, it might be useful to have a new name for the current geological epoch. 
and this to distinguish it from the earlier period, the Holocene, which began after the most recent Ice Age. Crutzen went on to describe the, quote, escalation of human-induced changes that in his dating would have begun in the latter part of the 18th century, when polar ice began to show higher concentrations of CO2 and other greenhouse gases, especially methane. Different supporters of this model have placed the beginning of the Anthropocene much farther back, uh, somewhere between five and 8,000 years ago, while others still have claimed that the Anthropocene should be coterminous with the Holocene, the period of the earliest changes in ecological systems induced by humans, including pla in places such as the Amazon, about we'll, which we'll hear in a moment, and even further back in southern Africa and, um, and Australia. Philippe Descola and Bruno Latour are important interlocutors on these questions because of their own past intellectual trajectories. Uh, Professor Latour has brought these questions to the heart of his own interrogations, including creative trajectories, such as the play that he wrote, which will have its premiere in Toulouse on Friday, and which we'll have a chance to hear about in just a moment. And although uh, Professor Descola may not have dedicated his own work explicitly toward addressing the notion of the Anthropocene, he has spent the last two years at the Collège de France focusing his energies on anthropological approaches to the landscape, a topic that can infuse recent approaches to the Anthropocene, I think, with a richer and more ethnographically robust set of evidence uh, from which to judge the impact of human perception and the natural environment. This can help us to ascertain the extent to, the extent to which anthropology as a discipline if it can be understood as a single discipline at all, given its myriad fields of engagement and divergent methods and practices, can contribute to understanding the human role in causing the kinds of massive environmental changes that include global warming. For all of these reasons, we thought that the Museum of Anthropology, or MOA, was a particularly appropriate venue in which to ask questions of two philosophers turned anthropologists both of whom are concerned about human intervention in the natural world and indeed, on a larger scale, our, own, our, our impact on planetary systems. Global warming has been called a slow catastrophe, and we might, in the end, ask our speakers to reflect on earlier apocalyptic epochs. We know, of course, there are many such events in recorded human history to see if we might glean some clues as to how we might confront our own. This is, of course, just one strand in a much larger conversation, but the question of why we as a species have been, up until now, unable to garner consensus and move forward collectively on these questions was precisely the question, in fact, that Bruno asked us to consider in his Monday night lecture. And it may require us to think about how humans operate on both very local levels, something for which anthropology as a discipline is particularly skilled, and also on very global levels. Hopefully tonight we'll have a vigorous conversation and debate on precisely these issues of scale, discipline, and perhaps diplomacy. The way that we're going to handle um, the structure for, um, for this is that uh, initially I'm going to ask some questions to sort of get things going and to offer the opportunity for both Professors Descola and Latour to give an outline of some of their own orientations toward this issue. Uh, we'll allow them to um, con converse uh, amongst themselves and then we'll open it up later to questions from the audience. So um, with that, I will now ask uh, Professor Descola to, um, if he would, to describe, in a sense, um, from his work in Beyond Nature and Culture, the four ontological frameworks for understanding human engagement with the natural world, obviously in a necessarily condensed format, um, but so that, um, so that the people in the audience can have a sense of uh, the argument more generally and how it may relate to our, to our topic at hand. Thank you, Neil. I would like to start by saying how moving it is for uh, an anthropologist like myself who has specialized in the study of native cultures of the Americas for more than 30 years to be in such a place to, uh, for such a debate. Um, 
although uh, I've worked in another part of the Americas, in the Amazon, uh, I'm not completely uh, uh, disconnected from the ethnographic literature, at least on the Northwest Coast uh, 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 First Nations. And so to be here is a little bit like being back at home. And for this, I would like to thank uh, the Museum of Anthropology, uh, the Peter Wall Institute and French Consulate who have made this uh, uh, interaction between Bruno Latour and I possible. I would like also to say that we have been, uh, we have been having a, an ongoing conversation with Bruno Latour for many years uh, because we are both interested in the same general problem which is to uh, describe, qualify and account for complex sets of interactions between humans and non-humans. Although we have been um, looking at these interactions from very different point of view, as, 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 you, as Neil Safir, as you already mentioned, uh, Bruno, uh, more, more or less at the same time, uh, Bruno was uh, uh, starting his ethnographic inquiry at the Salk Institute into the laboratory life, and he found out that scientists, uh, in spite of what they are publicly saying, were in fact constantly mixing bits of nature and bits of culture. I was at the same time in the Amazon, in the upper Amazon, and I was uh, working with a, a native society, the Achua, where they accepted the peace, first peaceful contacts very uh, few years before. And um, I discovered also, my ambition at the time was to analyze the relationship between the, the, the society and its environment. I realized also that the notion of nature and culture was absolutely senseless to uh, make some sense of what these people were doing when they were interacting with the non-humans around them. And so we, we, we started from a very different standpoint and we've been trying to uh, um, understand what each other is doing ever since. Um, and to answer your question, Neil, I would have to go back to this basic thing for an anthropologist, which is the triggering experience of ethnography. When I, uh, as I said, we, with Anne Christine Taylor, we spent several years with the Achua, and uh, I had started with the idea that I would study the material and ideal. Uh, dealings of the society with its environment, how it adapted to a specific set of constraints and a, a specific ecosystem. And I ended up my study by being convinced that not only uh, these people, and I will return to that later, created in large part its environment, but also that this environment was not at all an environment in the sense of a background, a backdrop, but it was a series of partners with whom the Ajwa were constantly uh, engaged into a dialogue. And this, of course, uh, uh, traced the way or paved the way for the research program that I've been ever since developing, which is to try to understand how humans interact with non-humans by getting rid of this category that we have inherited from our philosophical and modernist past, in particular these notions of nature and society, of nature and culture. So as some ethnographers do, I maintain the ethnographic contact with the Achua, but at the same time I embarked on a large comparative project well, I try to, by reading the ethnography of my colleagues, um, to elaborate or pinpoint some kind of specific systems of continuities and discontinuities that people perceived between themselves and the, the beings that were around them. And the result of that is a, is a, is a, is a, is a fourfold uh, uh, form uh, or system uh, which started in fact from the reflection on the Ajwa who um, 
tend to attribute an agency, what we as anthropologists translate as a soul, uh, to most things around them. They detect a sort of intention in most of the things around them, and so uh, entering in communication with these beings with all kinds of devices I won't enter into. At the same time, they had the idea that every species, by species I mean every distinct form of life that has a morphological consistency uh, at its own world. That is, that the interaction between a species and the world was geared onto specific biological aptitudes of this species. So it's an idea that was very much like the uh, uh, Jacob von Uxkull theory in, in ethology, whereby an animal uh, is connected to the world by certain elements of its biology, uh, although of course the Atua wouldn't think in terms of biology. And this opposition uh, between a general, the general idea that there are intentionalities everywhere in the world, but that in fact every form of life is segmented. When discussing it with colleagues, in particular with uh, a, a, a Brazilian colleague with whom I've been also exchanging over many years, uh, Eduardo Viveros de Castro, um, Eduardo told me, well, you see, it, 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 it's exactly the contrary to what we do in the West. In the West, we tend to restrict our interiority, the soul subjectivity, the cogito, the uh, etc., to uh, humans. But at the same time, ever since Descartes, of course, and the theory of the animal machine, we tend to uh, see humans as being part of a wider form of physical life, which is ruled by the same uh, laws of physics and chemistry. So there were there two different forms of detecting continuities and discontinuities between humans and non-humans. And so I started working with that, and I decided to label animism just salvaging a very old and dis, 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 uh, this uh, or the disrespected or disreputed uh, concept of the history of anthropology to name this capacity that some people had to detect continuities in certain domain and discontinuities in other domains. And I opposed it to um, what I call naturalism, that is precisely the idea that nature is the unifying set uh, a feature that allows to unite humans and non-humans. But there were also other forms of, uh, of continuities and discontinuities, and these were predicated precisely on this ability that I surmise humans have of detecting discontinuities and discontinuities by using their, 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 their own, the perception of their own person as being uh, constituted of mental states and physical events. And uh, so another form would be where all beings are share certain features which are both moral and physical. And this, this is what has been uh, very well described in Australia for Aboriginal people. Uh, who within each descent group, each totemic group, uh, surmise that they possess with other beings in the world, with a set of humans of course, but with other beings in the world, certain features, sometimes defined physically very precisely, the form of the hair, the color of the, of the, of the, of the, of the skin, etc. And moral features also, what we define as moral features, being alert or rather slow, being uh, witty or not, being bulky or uh, uh, rather elongated, etc. 
uh, and other groups which also are composed of humans and non-humans have different features. So within each of these groups, there's a conflation of these qualities. So it's another way to detect also continuities and, discontinu and discontinuities, and they uh, supposedly are coming from uh, a prototype, which is the totemic being, the being of the dream time, which transmits, it's not an ancestor in the traditional sense, it's really a prototype, it's, uh, it's could be considered as a sort of uh, uh, a template that transmits these features from generation to generation to humans and non-humans. And of course there's a, a, a fourth form of detecting continuities and discontinuities, which is in fact to emphasize something which belongs to the common experience of every, every one of us, which is that everything is distinct in the world. Nothing is similar. So the world is composed of singularities. But such a world is unthinkable and unbearable. So in order to get to grips with such a world, we have to find some form of some forms of correspondences between these divided elements. And this I call analogism. Why analogism? Because analogy is the usual form of reasoning which allows one to find this correspondences between different elements. Although analogy, of course, is uh, standard in any human being and in any culture. But in this specific respect, uh, analogy becomes a central obsession. So these are cultures that are, or what we use, usually call cultures that are common in Western Africa, in the Far East, uh, in uh, in, uh, in, in Mexico, in the, in the Andes, etc. So this form of detecting continuities and discontinuities are not classifying machines. They are uh, what I call modes of identification which allow to build models for interpreting ethnographic uh, 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 realities. And this, these uh, ethnographic realities, I chose to call them ontologies in the sense that by the word ontology I strive to go to a more uh, fundamental level of understanding of what these different set of cultural features uh, are in the sense that, uh, and this is that something that we share, Bruno Latour and I, um, I have come to think as an anthropologist that categories, not only like nature and culture, but also society, history, art, which have been forged in the trajectory of our own development as reflexive tools to understand what we are in the West, are completely inadequate in order to understand or to account for other forms of collective. So I, I borrowed the word collective from Bruno Latour precisely in order to define specific sets of aggregates that would not be societies in our sense. The society is a collection of humans which define itself by differentiating from other collections of humans and from its environment. That's the standard accepted knowledge that we teach, that we've been teaching, I don't teach it anymore, of course, but that we have received as recent wisdom in departments, in departments of uh, social sciences for a long time. <laughs> I, I, I was just saying that might be a good, a good segue to um, ask, uh, moving over and talking about collectives and talking about binaries and talking about sort of a shared um, uh, set of methodological assumptions, uh, we can, uh, have uh, Bruno react to anything that, uh, that Philippe has said on that, on that score. Uh, thank you. Well, first, uh, I'm not at ease in this museum, contrary to Philippe. And uh, contrary to Philippe, I, I'm not really uh, a scholar. Uh, I'm an amateur anthropologist, uh, probably 
sort of people who would have brought in, in, in a museum like this in the old days a, a few objects that they would have donated to the real uh, professional. And Philippe is a real professional of anthropology. Uh, my, uh, so I'm intimidated by those poles around me and uh, I'd like to draw one, so to speak. And uh, we are interested in collectives, as Philippe uh, mentioned, which is clearly not society. And um, we are here to try to see and to ask uh, Philippe, representing here the anthropology, what uh, difference does it make to situate uh, his work in the new framework of the Anthropocene, if I understood your argument. The Anthropocene is a very tricky uh, notion because uh, it could also be a new extension of what Philippe has just presented as naturalism expanded to the whole uh, planet. So let me try to draw one of his little totem pole um, which are on the top of it, so we want to study collectives. We realize that we have to go beyond uh, nature and culture, but then there is an immediately a problem with the beyond, because uh, as long as we have a true <laughs> nature and culture, and then we try to get beyond, um, as Philip has, has shown, um, we don't move very much. We can do a dialectic, uh, we can do all sorts of little um, tricks. But I think what, in spite of the name but the, of his book in, in, in French and in English, it's not beyond, it's before or beneath, so to speak, uh, nature and, 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 and culture. And for that we need to probably uh, bring in another um, element which is mentioned in Philip just a minute ago, which is the notion of agencies, which are of course well represented uh, here. And uh, the sort of connection which I think is important before we assess the originality of the word Anthropocene is to try to see if the Anthropocene designates an extension of naturalism to the planet, including the humans. And that's, of course, a temptation when we see the <coughs> human as a geological force. So to use one of the repertoire of those things here, it will be the human painted or <coughs> metamorphosed into a geological force, like a volcano, uh, a sediment, uh, <coughs> a, 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 a storm. Um, and of course, in terms of uh, energy developed by both, they begin to have some sort of similarity. This is what the Anthropocene concept is about, as you reminded us at the beginning, that is, the, 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 it's not a large nature and puny human, it's now something where the order of influence and action is uh, somewhat similar, at least comparable. And that's introduced a very new and very important twist in the notion of agency, because uh, agency is, is and, and that's where I think there is a, mm -hmm. A friendly and long and interesting conversation between anthropology of science, if I can use this, this uh, denomination for my little field and the real anthropology. I think uh, Philip introduced in preparing for this meeting the notion of interagentivity. Uh, the term is not fabulous, but it, 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 it describes something which is very difficult to describe in terms of nature of culture even beyond, which is beneath. Um, so for instance, uh, if you read a scientific paper, it will be full of agents doing all sorts of things in the development of the scientific paper itself. So there will be a lot of agentivity in the beings which are mobilized in the scientific paper. And then there is the official version of the scientific paper, is that it's a causal relation. And here, when you say it's a causal relation, the agentivity is lost, so to speak. So, one way of approaching this question, we're trying to move inside the 
interagent, the swapping of property between agent could be a way to describe many of the things Philip described with the four table, but it would also be useful to describe a lot of the scientific practices itself. That is, the inter <laughs> the shift of property among agents in science and the shift of property among uh, entities in many of those uh, situations that are surrounding us is not unrelated. So it's not that there is the science of objectivity here and then there would be all sorts of other ways of doing or thinking about agent there. So there would be a multiplicity or at least four modes here and one mode here. It is that uh, e the extraction of the agentivity in, by the scientist and the in invention that goes in it is not unconnected with the extraction and pluralism of agency that we observe in the, in the anthropological literature. So it means that there is one way which is to go beyond and there is another way which is to go uh, before. And the word I use to describe this situation is uh, sort of like a metamorphic zone which is essential for scientific practice and also essential for lots of other practice. So what we, it's a way to, to try to get at the metamorphic zone is, is a way of uh, testing this notion of Anthropocene. Is it? So the question is quite simple. Is it an extension of a definition of matter and objectivity where now the humans are sort of chosifiés or reified to use an old expression and then added to the pot mm -hmm. which is one of the version of the Anthropocene clearly in the eyes of the geoengineers, which are one of the plan B to accommodate the present uh, crisis, which is to say, okay, basically the world is a machine, the humans are part of it, the humans engineers are also able to monitor the whole question, while they mess it up a bit uh, in the industrial, since the industrial revolution, but now we are doing, we are messing it up well, so to speak we are taking over. So there is a sort of, of, of huge hubristic possibility in the notion of Anthropocene. And that's why it's a tricky and dangerous uh, concept. But then there is another version which is, no, no, it's not about objectifying, naturalizing the human one more, because the whole history of uh, social science is full of those. It is rendering impossible to distinguish in those collectives the part of which which, are, which were before attributed to the sort of human zone and the one which are attributed to the natural zone. And that's what I call the metamorphic uh, zone. So, that, so I want to use a physiomorphic language or to use an anthropomorphic language or to use a biomorphic language, or to use a zoomorphic language, is something which anthropologists study, and the work of Philippe is exemplary of that. But it's also a way to approach all of those questions which are common to anthropology of science and to anthropology proper, that is uh, this constant shift in the morphism, so to speak. I'm more interested in morphism than in the prefix. Is it anthropomorphism, biomorphism, zoomorphism? It's not so important. Morphism is the question. So now I'm going to ask a question if I'm allowed to Philip. Yes. Because uh, so there is this question, what is the Anthropocene going? Where is the Anthropocene going? One of the ways, of course, which is very impressive to ask this question in this place here is, of course, there are many other ways of occupying the earth than the naturalist. And uh, so my first question is, how original for him is the notion of Anthropocene? Is it just 
a sort of new avatar of a naturalism. And the second question is, okay, the ecological crisis, if the geologists are right, is unprecedented for the naturalist and for these other ways of holding the collective. So that's where I'm interested to know how unprecedented is. Are we saying how can we learn from these other ways of, of occupying the, the scene, so to speak? Um, or is it that we are simultaneously all uh, deprived of our, as you said in your introduction, uh, faced with something for, for which neither of the uh, four uh, um, modes of relation has uh, a tool because the, you know, it's so unprecedented. So you see there is one version of the Anthropocene which is the extension of modernism basically. So the Anthropocene becomes another version, it will be the way of managing the planet as, as a big machine where big engineers and strong authority will be in common and there is this dream in, in, of course, in the history of modernism. Or is it on the contrary the redissemination of the agencies where now what counts politically is this uh, swapping of property between agent, what Philippe called inter agentivity. So this is the, the sort of line I would uh, draw in my little uh, totem pole. If you want. I'll try to answer. Uh, the idea that uh, humans have become a geological force is not completely foreign to uh, anthropologists who study uh, non-modern people. Uh, the, the cultural history of the place I know a little which is Amazonia, in the past 30 years, has shown how this, what we used to call natural environment, has been, in fact, anthropized, is it the correct English word? Well, transformed by humans in the course of several millennia. Of course, in, in the structure of the forest first, uh, in the sense that the ever since the first uh, domesticated plants were uh, domesticated uh, about 8,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago in some cases. Um, the, the structure of the forest because of the technique of Sweden cultivation has been profoundly transformed so that the actual Amazonian forest is not the last biggest chunk of virgin nature on the world, but it's a largely anthropogenic forest. But there's another aspect to it, which is even in the soil, so we are talking about geolo geological forces. In the soils, uh, the, the population that occupied um, Amazonia at the time of the conquest were, as you know, much more numerous uh, than they are now. And uh, what archaeology begins to show now is a very densely uh, settled part of the world. And one of the results is that the soils have changed in the course of this occupation. Uh, and we found now, in many parts of Amazonia, anthropogenic soils, that is, soils that have been enriched by the presence of humans, which are black soils in parts of Amazonia where geologically there should be no black soils because these are um, oxy soils, which are uh, acids and uh, not very fertile. Uh, so th this geological force has been going on for a long time. And for the people who were putting it in action, of course, uh, there was no global understanding that uh, what they were doing was already being a part of this transformation of the planet which has become obvious through new methods of testing and new criteria that we have used, which is uh, mainly uh, climate change and 
biodiversity, also the extinction of biodiversity. So it's a process, as some of the people discussing the notion of Anthropocene uh, has, has pointed out, it's a, it's, it's the, the Anthropocene may have well begun, more or less, uh, at the time of the Holocene, or be corresponding uh, in time with the Holocene. But there's been, of course, an acceleration, and some tipping points have been reached. So the, the important aspect of the Anthropocene now, and I think the political dimension of the notion, is precisely the, 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 the effectively uh, putting forward these tipping points. Uh, and it, in that respect, of course, we are moving from um, a, a, a local uh, apprehension of interactions between humans and non-humans to a more global one into which uh, the, ki the kind of universal uh, uh, assessment of what's going on is obviously an inheritance of a naturalist paradigm. It can't be otherwise. And at the same time, this assessment implies that all the local ways to perceive and act uh, in order to interact with non-humans that have developed at the, on the surface of the earth for many mil millennia uh, tend to be unified by this macro concept of Anthropocene. So, personally, I would retain its uh, political dimension and its usefulness as a political concept in order to do something, because as you said particularly the other day, uh, we have to do something, although we are not really aware of what we are going to do and what we have to do. But as a descriptive concept, I think um, it uh, overshadows the diversity of experiences of interagentivity, precisely, uh, that have developed in the course of the, of the millennia. But just to, just to throw out a, a bit of a challenge there, does that in a sense mean that anthropology as a discipline focused on these kinds of interagentivic questions um, throws its hands up about a concept as um, in a sense all-encompassing and all-powerful as the Anthropocene? Um, is it possible for the work that anthropologists do in this very, you know, uh, thick descriptive uh, uh, vein to contribute uh, to something that is so, um, so deeply political and, um, and perhaps goes outside of the ability of disciplines to do that? And that, in some ways, this is really kind of where I, would, I hope we can get to by the end of this conversation, is what can uh, academic disciplines um, that are confronting these kinds of questions, um, how, can, how can they intervene? And this is a lot of questions that you've been asking as well. How can they intervene in these larger issues when in fact their object of inquiry seems to be unable to deal with the kind of amplitude of the problem? Well, I think we have to be more precise about what anthropology means. It's a word that is, has been preempted by many disciplines. In fact, I'm not saying that that's the anthropology <laughs> of science. But everything becomes anthropological. Many historians uh, found the anthropologists also. Uh, uh, art historians uh, do anthropology of art, etc. And I think there's a confusion between a method, which is the eth ethnographical approach, which is a very valid method to, it's a style of knowledge which produces remarkable results, and the anthropological project which is um, trying to account for systems of difference that make sense and allow us to understand the variety of life forms uh, uh, as perceived and acted upon uh, by humans. And so I'm, I'm dreaming, uh, I have a dream <laughs> of a science, that precisely a science of interagentivity, which has been uh, envisioned by some pioneers like Gregory Bateson, for instance, uh, 
um, which would be very far from the actual anthropology, which is mostly what what is called anthropology in most places is a very generally good ethnographic descriptions of local realities with very little overarching concepts behind that. Uh, and I'm dreaming of a science that would precisely be de-anthropocized, and that's what I'm working at, as Bruno also in his own domain, that is trying to give more precisely agency, agency, which is, uh, I mean, anthropologists or ethnographers, let's say, observe when doing fieldwork with non modern society, the importance of the agency of spirits, of, of images, of uh, uh, randic mask, masks, uh, everything. Um, and at the same time, they used to describe that the most common and classical uh, uh, naturalist concepts, which are completely unable to describe that. So we have to reform completely the concepts we are using. Uh, not taking into account the very rich and long experience we had of trying to understand, make sense of non-modern forms of seeing the world, so as to be prepared to deal with new forms of interaction, of hybridity, of com complex construction uh, of humans and non-humans that were not traditionally envisioned in, for instance, the four forms of ontological continuities and discontinuities are set forth. And I think anthropology, if it is defined as such, is really something that should be, we should all engage into, uh, but which would need much more uh, skills than the one that traditional anthropologists uh, can mobilize. Uh, we need the skills of uh, ethologists, we need the skills of psychologists, we need the skill of many people in order to uh, build this science of interagentivity, which will perhaps allow us then to uh, grip. I'm not saying that we have to build a science uh, to uh, solve climate change, no. It never works like that, of course. But building this new kind of science would give us at least the impression of having a more firm, a firmer grip on what's going on than the actual division, especially the actual division, which is no sense between the science of nature and the sciences of culture. Yeah. You're, you're at the beginning of a very large project uh, where the methodology is crucial to approaching these kinds of questions. Do you, how do you view your project as fitting into a well, well I, I, I think it's very interesting that uh, Philippe reminded us that uh, Anthropocene has always been there, so to speak. It's coextensive with the Holocene, and the scale, of course, is different. Anthropisé, the French word we use, anthropisé, anthropized. anthropized. Um, and that uses this very important expression, which I think summarizes the way to answer the question around the Anthropocene, that uh, anthropologists should de anthropo De, de anthropize. De, this is the word, expression you use? De anthropocentrize, <laughs> which is a terrible word. I'm, and that, of I'm course, sorry. That's, that's a key issue because uh, this has been done in the past by naturalists, and when we say de anthropize, it meant objectify with a certain idea of what the natural sciences were. And what is to be done? is to de-anthropize by multiplying the number of agencies with which the humans in general are actually produced and encountering. Mm. And that can be done in many different ways. So if there is to answer your, precisely your question, which is what anthropology, sorry, I keep using the word, um, is doing is in ecological question, the bane is the idea of interconnectedness and global connections. So whenever you have someone interested in ecology, they would tell you, yes, yes, everything is interconnected, and they would do all sorts of gestures like that, saying it's all global, and it's probably something like an harmony, etc. And uh, the primary is that's the end of, of the discussion, because precisely the interconnectedness is first what we largely ignore, and what is very difficult 
to trace in any different discipline. So if there is one point of application of all of the social sciences we do is that uh, <laughs> to fight the notion of interconnectedness and globality already unanimously and universally known. And this is why it's very interesting to do the work collaboratively in anthropology of science as well as uh, in anthropology proper because the temptation is of course to say yes of course you guys you deal with great diversity of mode but I mean you have to accept that when we deal with a natural objective material phenomenon we encounter a great unity and of course ecology has always struggled with that and never get out of that and yes yes we have a great unity meaning then we have a great source of agreement and of course political agreement is along the line and the first is we don't I'm very interested to know that we were here you mentioned the word again in an unceded land well we live on an unceded earth which is not has not been ceded, if the word exists, ceded to the scientist. Or more exactly, no scientist can actually take over the age, define the agencies with which the word is produced. It's not an anti-science point. It's on the contrary, and again the climate controversy is very interesting for that, because it pits against those who think that there is one science, and basically, funnily enough, they are the skeptics, and those who multiply the numbers of sites necessary to produce the common world. So that lesson resonates exactly in the same way in the most advanced anthropology, the multiplicity, and in the most advanced and objective science. What has been withdrawn is the notion of unity, because the unity is a political concept. It's not a scientific concept, and it has to be produced by, uh, by uh, a collective uh, process, which is of course another matter. So I think it's quite interesting to see that this notion of multiplicity of agency uh, is actually a way to uh, not only not being intimidated by the universality which is used as a background to have a foreground uh, diversity of humans, but that the, if the slogan is <laughs> de-anthropologized, it's a good definition of the Anthropocene, because after all, that's what the Anthropocene is. We are collectively made of geology, of clouds, something which is, if you hear it, will not be completely incompatible with many of the people who build this thing around. Yes, we are made of all these things. This is, of course, the set of, agence, of agencement and dispositive is different, but the principle of the multiplicity of agents with which the collectives are composed is common. So there is another universality, in other words, of a prime, which is not the same universality as uh, those of a naturalist. And if there is one place to explore these things, it's in museums like this, where the subtle diplomacy of all the different nations and their respect for the different uh, ways of handling the question uh, is admirable. So in a way, if we have this museum plus a museum of science, under the same building, it would begin to be a good version of the Anthropocene with a diplomatic skill in the middle. And of course, it's rare because the science, I don't know if there's a science museum here, but it's somewhere else. The, the, the sciences are on the, on the far side of the campus. Okay, that's safely, the prime. Safely distant. Um, <laughs> in, in the spirit of multiplying the agency, um, uh, I think it might be an opportune moment unless you want to comment briefly on but it's been said to, to, to uh, allow people in the audience to ask any questions on the, on the myriad topics that have merely been, um, been opened up uh, uh, briefly here already, for those who dare. Wait, wait, uh, pl wait please wait for the microphone since uh, this is being recorded as well. This is just, hello, is on? There we go. This is just a question, I'm gonna sit down so I can actually see, um, about the, the idea of diplomacy and how that is negotiated 
Um, perhaps this has taken the analogy a little too far, but to have an arbiter or to have a diplomat, you have to have agreement between the warring sides or the sides that are in conflict. And so I was just wondering if you could explain the idea of a, a diplomat a little bit more. And perhaps more explicitly related to the topic, how does diplomacy um, contend with the, the notion of, of the Anthropocene specifically? Is there a role for a specific role for the kind of diplomacy that you discuss in the recent project vis-a-vis um, -vis critical cr crises like those that the Anthropocene? But, but diplomacy, I mean, Anthropocene in the naturalist sense, or in the one we try to bricoler here, which is a sort of... Uh, well, the, the Anthropocene, in the naturalist sense, doesn't need any diplomacy. It needs uh, geoengineering. Unfortunately, it's probably what will happen. I mean, it's, it's really the tendency of all the... Um, and in that case, there is no diplomacy. We know what the world is like. Uh, it's made of a set of, uni of unified uh, general principle which applies across the board to machine and uh, let's pilot to machine as best as we can. It's a big Boeing 70, it's a metaphor of planet Earth uh, as a vessel spatial, a spaceship, Earth as a spaceship and the notion of stewardship which is another one. Now if we talk about the, the one, uh, this other version that Philip introduced and I, I try to uh, comment upon which is dehumanized. No. De-anthropocentrism. Uh, that is multiplying, <laughs> let's get this provisional word, multiply the agencies with which the collectives are composed. Uh, we, the diplomat is the one who tries to build this middle ground in a situation when there is no, precisely no unity and no eco unity, which is usually the way it's done, but everything is interconnected and there is one big global earth. And uh, I think it's very exemplary in this museum how, how uh, the diplomacy already just to try to figure out the different claims to the soil or the claims to the cosmology uh, are handled in a place like this, give an idea, and I think a very good model to handle uh, and other, other, many other claims to uh, the many ways they are to have a soil uh, uh, on earth. I mean, on earth. And that's where the diplomat is useful. The diplomat arrives when there is no state. And ecology works with the idea that there is a state of nature, a state of nature, S double S, and capital S, capital N, which means that there is no real conflict, no real discussion. It's difficult to produce a rationality, but it's not, there is no deep, deep political crime to solve in ecology because we know what the world is like. Now, if we don't, if there is this multiplicity we're talking about, diplomacy becomes necessary because every single element of the middle ground has to be produced from bottom up, so to speak, and every gesture might be misinterpreted, especially for example, the problem, what, do, what, what it is to talk to scientists which are criticized for being irrational, even though they are writing this uh, marvelous report, which is called the uh, IEPCC report. And that's, that's a very tough case of, uh, of, of, of dispute. So that's what the diplomat is. And Anne Christine Taylor yesterday in a, in, a, in a talk actually mentioned the word diplomacy to define the space of a museum, many of the museum of anthropology which is a very interesting notion uh, which has just to be extended to Museum of Science, Civilization, etc. Yep. Well, Bruno knows I have misgivings about the notion of diplomacy, um, perhaps because I'm more familiar with fueling societies than with laboratories of biology. Uh, the, to have a diplomat, you said you, there's, when there's no state, but uh, you need at least some elementary notions that people will share the size of the table, when people will be seated, the type of discourse they will be allowed to, to uh, maintain, 
uh, the kind of arguments they will use, etc. So what we know of the history, especially the history of the conquest of the Americas, is uh, something where diplomacy was very, very seldom applied. And uh, when I, you asked me uh, not long ago if there are precedent, no, Bruno asked me if there are precedent for the uh, Anthropocenos. Uh, just imagine that in the, in the, well, everybody knows that, but in the 16th century, uh, people of the, of the Amazon region, other parts of the America, but it was very key also in the Amazon region, lost about 90% of their population. So they know what the apocalypse is. They know that in one generation, um, they can almost disappear. Some of them will disappear, groups will disappear, neighbors will disappear, people will die of hunger because they cannot uh, cultivate uh, gardens anymore, nobody goes to uh, for fishing or hunting, etc. And in this first encounter, there was no diplomacy. So now this is diplomacy, of course, the, uh, but it's a diplomacy which is imposed by uh, the Brazilian state, the Ecuadorian state, etc., whereby Indians are invited uh, to sit at long tables where they are, ex where they, people explain, bureaucrats explain to them what uh, is, uh, uh, what are the plans of the government and if they wish to participate in it or not. Usually they wish not to participate, <laughs> they wish to opt out and they wish not to enter into a di uh, diplomatic protections. So <laughs> I think you have a, a very optimistic way of putting things when you uh, use uh, this, uh, I understand it's a diplomatic uh, metaphor, um, but I think that um, power relations, conflicts uh, um, are perhaps a motto that will be more powerful in shaping uh, the face of what we are to uh, face precisely in the decades to come than uh, diplomacy. But it's a, an old discussion that way. Well, and that, and that, also, <laughs> that also brings us back to the question of the scale at which human beings are able to sort of operate and function and the extent to which, <clears throat> I mean, the, the, the arrival of the state to, um, to sort of negotiate on behalf uh, of, of, of its people or to um, have intergovernmental agencies that are, that are functioning on a much broader scale, in a sense, drives against the idea of the kind of interagentivity that we're talking about between objects or people on a much smaller, smaller scale. And our inability as humans to necessarily empathize with anything that goes beyond a very restricted range of, of sentiment and, and, and emotion may also be playing a role in, um, in, in doing that. So I think the question of scale is very, is very significant here in terms of assessing the, 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 the possible ways out of that, of that issue. Well, you want, you want me to, di to disagree with Philip? <laughs> well, I, well, it's what people no, are, are waiting It's for. another way of asking. So I re-ask my question, which is, which is uh, yes, of course, diplomacy is understood as, as a very peaceful solution. It's ridiculous in a situation of, of hard conflict. But I was interested in precisely the novelty of the situation. For example, as you know, much better than I do, many of the... Uh, Amazonian Indian, and you know that as well, or, are organizing and using a lot of the ecological, political ecology theme in order to fight for several of the problems of conservation, etc. And they are portrayed back as uh, people who conserve an untouched forest. So now we have a nice situation here, which is people say, no, 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 we are not conserving an untouched forest, we have transformed it. We have been, as you said, being transformed for millinery, and uh, we are as interested in the artifactualization of the landscape as you, but we don't want the same artifact. So that's another situation which is where we can imagine. I'm still answering your question of what the anthropology is useful in practice. Uh, well, you don't have to play the role of the good Indian, which is the one for ONG. <laughs> 
ONG, uh, non-governmental non NGO, non sorry, uh, the sort of uh, uh, good savage uh, with feathers in order to fill in the, the slot in defense of nature, uh, fights on a different ground, which is, yes, we have transformed entirely this place. So it's not nature versus wild wilderness versus uh, industry. It's two different ways of artifactualizing, if you can say that. Uh, that's the sort of thing I'm talking, I'm, I'm designating with the word diplomacy, but it's a situation where the multiplicity of the ontologies allows another encounter, which of course a new encounter, it, it, as, as I know from your people, the Ashwa, they don't want to discuss with me about ecology and anything, they just want to get out. Okay, but the ecological crisis is there for them as well as for us, even though the responsibility between me, I mean me is not too much, but I mean you, American, bigger for you from me, we need only two Earth, we need five, uh, and we need zero variable two. Uh, even though responsibility is different, the problem we confront is the same. Or at least is being slowly built as being one problem. It's different. This is where diplomacy enters. It's not, oh, there is one big problem which is the global scene, because the globe doesn't exist. And the globe should not be mobilized here. There is no globe to be mobilized here. It's too fast. So let's slow down. It's not global. It's, it's another way of producing connection. Well, it seems to me that, just to follow what Philip said, people who, who say, we have transformed this Amazonian landscape for millineries, uh, so we are not playing the role of a good savage, uh, uh, may allow, I mean, it's a, it's a diplomacy, so there's no way to solve the question in advance may allow a different take between two people who have, I mean, two sort of people who are all for artifactualization, realizing artifacts, but in a very different mood. That's what I mean by diplomacy. It's a novelty for people confronted with a new threat where the task of anthropology to multiply the world, that is the agency, may open configuration which are impossible when you have defense of wilderness and industry and the other. We know that that goes nowhere because industry always wins. Does that bring more interest from Philip and no, the first version or not? It's not a question of interest, but what I find interesting as an anthropologist observing precisely the the different forms of protest of uh, native movements of the world over is that they tend to uh, uh, take very specific shapes that are distinct from one another according precisely to the, uh, the sort of basic ontological premises uh, they, they, their collectives are based on. Uh, in the Achua, was all respecting in their territory, but they dealt with it very simply. They uh, took hostage the three engineers that had been uh, going there to explore, and, and they and they and they kept them captive for three months. Uh, probably a few years ago, the army would have bombarded the villages uh, uh, with napalm, but it's not done anymore, and so it has stopped all all prospection in the territory. A bit further up north in the or south rather in the Andes, uh, there's another, another form of collective mobilization around uh, uh, precisely uh, uh, questions of uh, ecology and uh, these collectives are very different. They are what are called analogous collectives whereby in fact uh, the collective is coextensive with the world but segmented. And it's formed uh, of human segments and also natural segments, you know, river, lakes, uh, mountains, etc. And here they uh, had demonstrations against the fact that a mining company would uh, um, start mining at the foot of a mountain, not because it would pollute the rivers, or because it would, uh, they would 
uh, impinge on their territory or whatever, but because this mountain was a part of the collective, and as such didn't want to be disturbed. And so this, the human segment, protested as uh, 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 empowering, let's say, the mountain as another element of the, and I could multiply examples such as this. And I think there's no diplomacy in the traditional sense that you, or, or even the non-traditional sense that you mentioned here, but a, a wide diversity of way to make understood to other, to naturalists in particular, um, uh, these complex forms of interagentivity or interaction, or whatever, between humans and non-humans. And this probably is going to last for some time, and I hope it will. Um, and thinking of a unified diplomatic service that would deal, uh, or that would not, no, I'm pushing too far, uh, <laughs> but that, that would be in charge of negotiating all these settlements seems to go against what is in fact happening and what is extremely interesting, which is a huge amount of small reactions that take very different forms, that are very difficult to understand for naturalists, uh, such as the litigations here, it's, uh, the litigations in British Columbia or in Australia for that matter, uh, which are based on the uh, British common law, uh, are there is no common ground between the right that people want to assert on their land, on, the, on their environment, etc., and the way it is perceived, of course, by the laws. And so all these little uh, confrontations uh, are interesting in the sense that they put or restore some diversity um, to the composition of the world, or at least make obvious to the naturalist that there is diversity in the composition of the world, for exactly. so the more clear-sighted. The example you gave is exactly what I mean by diplomacy. <laughs> the point that it becomes diplomacy once they meet an, a naturalist, which is not saying, ah, but all of those are cultural, strange, irrational ways of dealing with the thing, and that's diplomacy because diplomacy is a term to say of these examples which are precisely one I'm interested in building the thing from ground up without any sort of general features which were impossible to recognize before because they were immediately framed in as subjective ways of handling something which is already settled in advance by the naturalist because it doesn't deal with the ontological characters of what the world is like. So I agree, it's exactly the sort of example which you know much better than me, which I would define as uh, the source of a, uh, the diplomatic uh, encounter, but because here it's whatever well, concept to answer the question is that it is diplomat arise when there is no, precisely no referee. So the naturalist enter into the situation of diplomacy when they hear the stories that you say as multiplicity of ontologies, not, ah, you do very strange ways there, but the thing is already settled, sorry, we know what the world is like. And that's where anthropology as a political uh, dimension, I think is very important because it, it, it precisely characterizes this situation as being worth a diplomatic effort and not just the encounter between uh, a question which is already settled, which is of course the danger of naturalism, the world of object is actually already well known. So this is, I don't disagree. I understand better what you mean by diplomacy, but uh, then uh, uh, I doubt that the word would be entirely adequate. Then. So we, dis <laughs> we disagreed for a while. That was enough time to... Uh, to this, uh, Yes, yeah, so we have a question over, over there. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah, for sure. um, actually, it's really interesting right now, as we sit here, 
underneath these totem poles, the ancestors, the people who made these totem poles, their um, descendants are now fighting um, the pipelines that are proposed for the northern BC. And you talk about diplomacy, they find any way possible. I mean, it's been very interesting to watch and actually in the last week and in the week to come, we're gonna hear a lot more about this. Um, so here we are right here in British Columbia, you know, um, experiencing exactly what you're speaking about. But it seems to me when we look at these, these um, figures, these frogs and ravens, these real creatures, these cedar poles, um, all of us on the planet have ancestors that did this kind of multiplicity that had these forms. So surely we should be able to recreate that even just at an individual level and make it a, a, a positive thing and slow down the geologic, the very quick force of the Anthropocene at the moment? Would you say that that's possible? Big question. I would say it's very optimistic. <laughs> and the fact that uh, well, people live in, each one of us, we live in different worlds at the same time. So we may very well come into this museum and be moved, admire these uh, artifacts, even begin to understand what they are about, and at the same time uh, pursue a very different agenda in our professional life which is entirely disconnected from this. So this multiplicity of identities that each one of them hosts um, renders this form of um, pure sightedness <laughs> that you wish, wish for. Um, that's a bit dubious in my, but perhaps I'm utterly pessimistic. What do you think? I have lots of trouble with the acoustic, but it's the optimistic scenario to you. Uh, well, it's hard to be optimistic right now, but um, I think there's one of the arguments is around this notion of global. The globe is always achieved too fast. It's globalized too fast. So the more um, there is occasion to um, stop or, or slow down the uh, globalization, that is the idea that there is this in general interconnectedness which makes that everything is linked. Uh, everything about, every time this is slowed down and that the multiplicity of agencies is allowed to uh, be uh, foregrounded um, and it can be done by many other resources than intellectual inquiry. It's also done by uh, militancy, it's done by artists, it's done by a uh, lot of the agents like the one which are populating the, uh, the Anthropocene story, that is clouds, ice, and fish, who seem to have a very, very quick way of reacting in very unexpected ways to what we do. So every time we, we learn of a new, I mean, I'm, I'm a disciple of John Dewey uh, argument about the, multiple, the unintended consequence of our action. And that's where the public and the politics uh, erupt. So I think one way of being optimistic is, is multiplying the unintended consequences. Because there is, there is this conflict in ecological issues. We are always talking about the interconnectedness. This is supposed to do politics, but politics is about the unintended consequence of action. So it's always this contrast between a political urge of a global and a political practice which goes exactly in the opposite direction and the two clash. So the optimist scenario, the optimist scenario is that every time we stop the global to globalize, it's good. So there are one way is to do the thing that Philip dis described, but of course the other way, and that's completely new in a way, is uh, to get at the sciences themselves, that is to insist on the multiplicity, and when I say science, I, science and technologies. So if, if only the two could be sort of, the two movements of multiplicity and the difficulty of composing the common word was brought together, we would have, I think, a uh, pretty strong attack. So 
it would be another way of defining the university. It would be the diversity, public diversity, and not public universities would be a way to frame this. I don't know if you can be optimistic. I invited in Paris a guy called Clive Hamilton, who is a philosopher of ecology, who wrote a book called uh, uh, Requiem for a Species. And the species is us, I mean, you, I mean, me. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, all this literature is not terribly optimistic, man. We have to cope. We have time for one, uh, one final question. Yes. Thank you. Um, thank you for your wonderful discussion about this very interesting concept. Um, I went to your talk on the other night, and uh, I'm just wondering about the, the geopolitical dimensions of this concept, uh, or the geological uh, political dimensions. Um, you gave a graph where you show that when you were born, the amount of carbon in the atmosphere was, you know, had quadrupled in the last 50 years. Can you, can you talk concept, closer to the, you have the to microphone? Oh, sorry. Thank you. This concept that has uh, an intention to describe also has um, a consequence of being co-opted in the sense of if we're farming the earth, we can geoengineer our way out of it. I'm just wondering what the thoughts are about bringing this concept forward in the context of ways it could be linked to, oh, well, people transformed the Amazon 5,000 years ago. Well, why can't we uh, deposit a bunch of iron in the ocean off of Hawaii and fix our um, ocean circulation issues. Well, actually, the guy I was mentioning, Clive Hamilton, who has written one first book, Requiem for Species, has written another one on geoengineering. And the second one is even more frightening than the first, because it goes for all of the, all of the plausible solutions, and many are, look completely crazy, but he, he, he used them as sort of completely matter of fact. And every one of them is, <laughs> seems like a huge catastrophe ready to happen. And at the end of the book, unfortunately, he says, well, yes, but this is plan B, and plan B is much more probable than plan A, which would be, we would do something about it. So uh, there is a danger in the notion of Anthropocene. I mean, it's, it's not a stabilized concept. It's not even a voted concept. They didn't vote the geologists who invented it, because they are, they, they are very well aware of the sort of sticky uh, nature of this uh, concept. It's why it's interesting for us because it's <laughs> it's like Gaia. It's, big, it's so unstable, and it goes in all sorts of directions. Uh, like all the questions we developed uh, tonight. I mean, they can very easily be a new uh, naturalism, even a naturalism diplomacy in a sort of sense. But on the other hand, it, it can go in a very different direction if we do our job right. If I understood the question. Okay, the, um, I, want to, I want to close, um, first of all, by thanking all of you for, for, for being here, and again to thank the Museum of Anthropology for hosting us, and the Peter Wall Institute, and the French Consulate for, um, for, for supporting this event. Um, and I wanted to, and of course, to Philippe Descola and Bruno Latour for um, joining us in what was really a um, a kind of interrogation of a concept that, uh, that could have relevance for the kinds of issues that we're facing in the future. And I wanted to end with a quote by um, uh, Deepesh Chakravarti, who wrote a very important article um, that has been um, oft-cited and, and has served inspiring about climate, the Anthropocene, and um, the challenges that such a concept makes to, um, to the disciplines. And he himself um, feels quite um, challenged by a lot of the, when he puts it into his, his own perspective um, as a historian and trying to understand what the appropriate 
uh, subject is for an issue like as, as complex as climate change. Um, and in addition to asking that we rise above our, of our discipli disciplinary prejudices, he also writes that, and I quote, the current crisis has brought into view certain other conditions for the existence of life in the human form that have no connection to the logic of capitalist, nationalist, or socialist identities, close quote. And I think for a historian to acknowledge that these traditional categories that about which so much has been written and through whose lens so much has been analyzed um, seem to be in many ways incapable of mapping on to the kinds of complex questions that we face um, as a species and as a um, um, and as as inhabitants of uh, this uh, this this Anthropocene. Um, encourages us, I think, to continue to have conversations like this, even though they may bring us somewhat outside of our own disciplinary comfort zones, but I hopefully together in such a way that we can work toward responding in some ways and seeing our disciplines um, and our non-disciplines as a way in which to do that. So please join me uh, in thanking our guests and uh, join us for the reception.